the reserve. Um, this talk tonight is part of a year-long monthly lecture series called the Ralph Newsom Lecture Series. It's funded in part by a, a grant from the Kikapua Reforestation Fund, also known as a, the Newsom Grant, and also the Friends of the KBR help out with refreshments out there. Um, this evening we have Jamie Nat. She's um, UW Extension Wildlife Outreach, Outreach Specialist. And she's here to talk to us about how to attract wildlife to your backyard. So I do need to um, take attendance, so please sign in. And I'll hand it over to Jamie. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Sadie. Um, welcome, everybody. I want to thank um, the Kickapoo Valley Reserve and also, of course, Sadie for reaching out and inviting me to come. So it was a nice trip this afternoon. I came in the daylight and did some work uh, along the way and had a chance to observe a bunch of wildlife. Um, saw a number of turkeys, lots of turkeys out here. In fact, this is an area I was telling Sadie that I grew up um, turkey hunting in when turkeys were first reintroduced to the state was over in this area. And we would come from Sheboygan County to chase turkeys up and down the hills here until the point that turkeys were reintroduced and well established over much of Wisconsin that I didn't need to travel anymore. But I uh, have lots of good memories of being in these hills and valleys usually starting up at the top of the hill until the birds would come down on a roost and instead of landing on the ground they would fly all the way down to the bottom of the valley and I climbed all the way up to the top for no reason so <laughs> anyway uh, certainly have a good uh, good memories here um, how about yourselves any interesting wildlife sightings lately anything unusual I saw an eagle on the way over which not terribly unusual right now along the Wisconsin River they're staging uh, it happens that we have a birding club here at the KBR. Yeah, great. I don't know if you heard this. And several of us that are here now are having our Saturday morning meeting where we sit in rocking chairs watching the bird feeder. Oh, wonderful. And as we were doing this, the northern goshawk came in, swooped right in, landed, spread its tail, gave us all a good look, and then just took off again. But didn't get anything, huh? No, Not we, that we time. think that it's hunting the stocked pheasants. Oh. Because, like uh, yesterday, I there were two hens and a rooster on the bird feeder. Yeah. yeah. Might be a little bit big of a bird yeah, for them. Typically they're after your bird feeder birds. Yeah. So, but um, a, 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 a goshawk it was? Yes. Yeah, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, that would be appropriate. Sorry, I was thinking coopers and sharp, no, sharp tails. So, yeah, they certainly would. And red tails, of course, mm -hmm. find a number of them as well. Um, not that we're in prime snowy, snowy owl habitat, but just wanted to mention um, last year there were over 300 snowy owls in the state and at this time last year there were around uh, 41 and last year was the largest eruption is what they're called uh, when this happens uh, largest amount of snowy owls that we've seen in over 50 years and this year we're already over 80 at this time where it was about 40 this time last year so why it's happening this year hasn't been um, confirmed or decided but something to keep track of in terms of the birding world and if it's an animal you'd like to get on your or a bird you'd like to get on your life list you're going to want to go to one of the um, coastal shores of Wisconsin or grassland areas um, airports places like that they're more of a grassland um, species and last year they started a project snowstorm it was called where they actually um, fitted 22 owls, four of which were in Wisconsin, with radio transmitters, and they work off of cell phone towers. So when they leave the area, they continue to collect data, and it's not until they return to this area near those cell phone towers that they get what's called a data dump. So um, scientists, biologists are really looking forward to hopefully having one of those four, or a couple of those four return to Wisconsin so we can grab that data and see where they've been spending their time. So again, just thought I would share some interesting um, anecdotes here related to wildlife. So, and there were three handouts on your way in and I'll talk about a landowner program that you may wish to consider at the end of the work um, presentation here too and I have a handout for that as well. How many of you by show of hands own 10 acres or more? How about 40 acres or more? 100 or more? Okay, good. So the way I frame this talk, attracting wildlife to your backyard with backyards in quotations, is basically that the information that's provided uh, tonight is applicable whether you own a quarter acre lot in the city or a thousand acres um, you know, of land out in the country. All the principles, all the requirements for wildlife are the same. We're just applying them at much different scales, okay? 
but that helps me frame, uh, serve as a frame of reference. There we go. So first of all, why manage for wildlife? Uh, of course, wildlife benefits. Uh, it's, it, we enjoy seeing the animals themselves. We enjoy working on the land. It's easy to do. It can increase our property value. A well-managed parcel certainly can add value to your um, add value. Energy and soil conservation, photography opportunities, natural insect control. When we talk about some of the birds and um, bat species, can help pollinate plants and disperse seeds. And it's really fun to involve kids. So. Um, talking about nature deficit or disorder and the last child in the woods and all this this concept of getting our young people uh, involved in the outdoors, this is one way as a parent or a grandparent you can get them involved in wildlife. And I think it's tremendously um, fun to do that. And of course my kids are really um, engaged in the outdoors. This is my daughter at, at grandma's pulling a great tree frog off of the, um, the deck that was all blended in. And, showing it to grandma who was kind of, you know, taken back a little bit that she would just grab it off the deck and walk around with it. So it's really fun to involve kids with this. Oops. All right, so what does managing for wildlife in it involve? It involves protecting, enhancing, and or creating new habitat. And it also can involve choosing land use practices and other management measures that are gonna benefit wildlife. In some cases, it's as simple as providing one missing element, such as a food plot, a nesting box, or a brush pile. Um, and we'll talk, th talk through some of these steps. Another example of, of something you could do is just be reducing or eliminating the use of herbicides and pesticides. To talk a little bit about Wisconsin's wildlife resource base, I thought I'd just give you um, a slide here with the numbers of the diversity. This is what you have the possibilities of being able to attract to your property. So we have roughly 525 species of wildlife in the state and 300 to 400 of those are birds. So there's a large range there because some of them migrate. So it depends on the time of the year that we're talking. I think by record there's been at least 421 birds, um, 421 birds documented in the state but not all of those breed or are considered resident species. For mammals, it's 72 plus or minus half a dozen. Depends on if you want to uh, count animals that are now extirpated, something like a wolverine. Not really here in Wisconsin anymore. They haven't had a sighting of a wolverine for over 100 years. A couple years ago, maybe 10 years ago, if you asked me if we had mountain lions or cougars, I would have said no. Can't say that anymore. We've documented at least six different individual mountain lions through DNA evidence uh, that have moved through the state. However, there is no breeding population of that animal. So it's only been males at this point and they've not established. So it depends if you want to um, count those. Our elk population is still in its reintroduction state. It's not established fully at this point. It's being uh, assisted. So it depends on how many how you want to count some of those animals. A number of years ago, those of you that know Scott Craven, uh, wildlife, ecologist, uh, Department of Forest and Wildlife Ecology, he took a phone call while he was on the radio of a woman who had said, and she was from the western part of Wisconsin, that hey, there's a prairie dog out by our barn. And this was a number of years ago where we didn't have access to um, Facebook and email and things like that. And Scott said, oh no, it must be a woodchuck that you're talking about. And she described the burrow and that it was alone and all these things. And they just agreed to disagree. And a couple weeks later, he got a photo in the mail of a very nice prairie dog out by her barn. So backtrack that story, he then got very curious about it, and it turns out they had gotten a load of hay from North Dakota that year. So that prairie dog lived in the state for a number of years and counted as a record. I think Scott wrote it up for a note and even got you know some kudos for writing it up and all of that as well. So um, that's the, that can be the difference in those, in those numbers a little bit. For reptiles and amphibians, Definitely not as many. It's uh, our cold temperatures, long winters, that we don't have the diversities of our herptiles, which is the collective term referring to reptiles and amphibians. For reptiles, those are our animals with scales. We've got 20 snakes, um, about 12 turtles, and four lizards. Amphibians, 19, one toad species, 11 frogs, and seven salamanders in the state. Okay, so the key to attracting wildlife to your backyard, no matter how big it is, are, the, are providing the four basic habitat needs. It's the if you build it, 
they will come. So you need to provide for these four, th these four items within their habitat if you want to attract the animals. So you have to decide what species you want to manage for. And you have to know about that animal by using field guides to be able to attract it. You want to bring bluebirds in, what do bluebirds need? Well, one of the things that's usually a limiting factor for them are they need, they need nest boxes or cavities or the old fence posts that they used to uh, lay a, or put their, build their nest in and, and have their nestlings in and so on. So you need to learn a little bit about them. For the most part, um, water is typically not a problem for wildlife um, unless you're an amphibian that, or a reptile like a turtle that's tied to water. For the most part, animals are very good at getting water from the environment, whether it is surface water or it's dew or it's from what they're eating, succulent vegetation or animal matter, they're getting water from other sources. Space is also typically not a, not a limiting factor for why an animal doesn't exist in an area but it may be why it doesn't exist on your property. It might be sharing your property plus two or three neighboring um, farms to make up its complete territory. <clears throat> Typically the limiting factors or the areas where you're gonna wanna focus for attracting are gonna be under food and shelter and cover. Animals need food and often they need different types of food throughout the year, okay? And as far as shelter, shelter can be even more of an issue than starvation. Animals like our, our severe winter last year, when we looked at our car-killed deer in the northern part and we looked at their fat content over some of their organs and along their back, they actually had pretty good fat reserves going into late winter. But they can die from exposure, the extreme temperatures, and not having enough thermal cover, um, evergreens and things like that for, for cover. So actually shelter and cover can be even more uh, limiting than food for many species. <laughs> okay, and then just to put one term out, uh, try not to get too technical here, but for carrying capacity, just want you to understand that a given habitat can only support so many individuals of the same species. We can use deer if you want, but in a one gallon bucket, only so many deer are going to fit. And then either you're going to see damage to deer population because there's not enough habitat and their population is going to become reduced through um, predators or starvation or disease. Or you're going to start seeing um, damage to the habitat itself, over browsing and things like that. So um, you can have really great habitat, but eventually animals will exceed their carrying capacity for that, for that area. However, within your um, Keeping in mind your geographic and your soil limitations, you can increase the carrying capacity of your property for wildlife by adding more habitat components or additional components like food and cover particularly. So um, you can actually increase the abundance of bluebirds by adding more of that um, structure that they need. But at some point, you can only have so many bluebirds because they are territorial to a degree, okay? All right, so I'm gonna break down those four requirements and just give you some general ideas on what to think about when we manage for food resources, for example. And it's gonna vary depending on the species. Again, if you're interested in rough grouse or amphibians, you're gonna be looking at different options to provide that food. But if we're talking sheer diversity, which would be my goal if I had the privilege of owning land, would be I just want as many different animals as I can provide, which means I really need to provide a lot of different types of habitat and including different types of food. So every species has its own um, food requirements. And, they, and um, to do that then, or to provide diversity, you're gonna to wanna to provide different types of food. So throw in the gamut at them. Fruits and berries, grains and seeds, nuts and acorns, nectar sources for those like hummingbirds, um, browse plants, forage plants like grasses and legumes and aquatic plants for some of those um, aquatic forebears, amphibians, um, some of those species that we use for those as well. And you want to select plants that flower and bear fruit at different times of the year. For those of you that have maybe a butterfly garden or a hummingbird garden, you've probably taken that year into about six months from early spring until late summer and you're planting flowers that bloom at different times throughout that time period so that you're always making nectar and these flowers available for hummingbirds or um, bees and things like that. 
So you want to select plants that flower and bear fruit at different times of the year, so you're always providing that at some point. Hopefully this is a, um, a message that everybody in this audience is, uh, understands, but we want to remove invasive species. Let me turn that a little bit from the wildlife standpoint. Native plants are going to be better adapted to our local climates and soils. That's pretty standard. But most insects that are important food sources for birds prefer, prefer a native host plant. Okay, they don't find invasives, you know, they didn't evolve with invasive plants, so they don't have that benefit. Native wildflowers often produce more nectar for hummingbirds than the cultivated hybrids, and more bird species and greater numbers of birds occur in areas with native vegetation than in areas with exotic, non-native vegetation. So when we, I take school groups along Lakeshore Path on Lake Mendota down in Madison, and we look at just stands of honeysuckle, and there's just all these berries, and of course the kids want to know if they can eat them, which, no, don't eat those, they're not, they're not good for you. But we talk about, well, why are all the birds in here, and yet all these berries are here, they're not eating them. There's no nutritional value for them. Um, they may have um, some slight toxic toxicity to them as well, but then there's a mulberry tree, and you show them the mulberry tree, and the birds are just all over it and um, have been eating on the mulberries. So many insects and other invertebrates are attracted to trees and shrubs, and they also provide a food source. So we want to think about the, the um, birds or the wildlife that feed on invertebrates as well. And then I'll just mention supplements. So these are things that you can provide in one form or another, to, especially if you have a bird feeding station or uh, you want to be able to watch birds close by. But birds chew their food with, a, with their gizzard, or their muscular um, part of their stomach. So to the aid in grinding, they'll swallow fine pieces of sand or gravel or even oyster shells. You can buy commercial oyster shells and put them out near your bird feeding station in a little dish and they'll come and um, you know, find that and, and grab it. And you can also use some people I know, especially if they have their own um, chickens, they'll take those eggs and if you break them up and sterilize them in an oven, then you can feed those eggshells, those cracked up eggshells to them as well without having to buy anything. And also if you have pheasants or game birds on your property, you can just leave um, little areas of sand and those birds will come in there and dust as well things like rabbits and it gets external parasites off of their, off of their bodies. All right, and then I want to just talk briefly about feeding because typically when we talk about wildlife and feeding wildlife, it's not necessarily a good thing. It's something we work really hard advocating um, to not feed raccoons or leaving pet food out and things like that because it habituates an animal to the area. So people get confused on, well, what about bird feeding? What do, you, what do wildlife folks say about bird feeding? And I feed birds and um, there's just some things to remember. So feeding birds is, is likely not an issue as long as you take steps to make sure you're cleaning bird feeders and, and watching the health of the birds that are visiting your feeders. But we also need to realize that this is sort of an easy way to provide food and to have them in close. So we, the real benefit to feeding birds is for us, not necessarily the bird. We feed birds because we want them to be in close. We want to watch them. We want to identify them. We want to um, be able to take pictures of them and so on. But long-term habitat management, planting those native trees and shrubs and um, forbs is going to have better return for our money and investment and we'll probably have a, a bigger diversity. So the other thing is just that many of our bird species, those 300 to 400 birds, don't ever come to bird feeders. Many of them. The vast majority never visit bird feeders. And even the ones that do come to bird feeders get a really small percentage of their nutritional intake from bird feed. So again, I'm not trying to um, dissuade you from feeding birds. I think it's great. But just keep that in mind that if you are really after diversity of birds, then you're going to want to backtrack and do some of those other things like adding native plants and shrubs and things like that because you'll enjoy a lot more birds on your property if you do that. And then I have lots of people calling about, you know, blackbirds monopolizing their bird feeders. And I imagine most of you in the room are well versed in um, tips for feeding birds. And that would be selecting high quality seed mixes, ones without a lot of fillers. 
because it's those fillers that attract some of those, dare say, trash birds that come in and spread that seed and kick it around. So it's expensive, but you'll get more bang for your buck by feeding black oil um, sunflower seeds and some of the higher quality seeds. You're gonna pay more for it, but it's gonna go to probably the more desired bird species. And then a few other things through research. Uh, one is placement of your bird feeders. They should be placed either within three feet of a window for viewing or greater than 30 feet away. It's that threshold between three and 30 feet that poses a danger for, wi for window collisions. So research found that birds that were close to the window within three feet at a feeder and were startled by something, when they bumped into the window, they didn't have enough velocity to be harmed, okay? So they, they glanced off of it, it didn't, it didn't harm them. And then after 30 feet, they had enough room to recognize and negotiate that there was a window there and make a counter move to avoid it. It's within that three to 30 feet that they startle from that Cooper's hawk coming in or a cat or you go out the back door or something like that, that they end up crashing into the window with enough speed that it causes um, an injury or death. So that's something to keep in mind too. And then the other, whether you have outdoor cats, hopefully not, but maybe a neighbor does, um, you also wanna provide cover within maybe 30 feet of that feeder, but not right at the feeder because it serves as an ambush point for predators, okay? So if you put your bird feeder right in a bunch of shrubs, that is a potential place for predators to lurk. And especially if you've got juncos or morning doves on the ground, it's you know fairly easy for them to um, pick them off from, from cover. So just some, some tips. And then the other things, again, feeding, feeding birds, wonderful, enjoy it. Um, it's an expensive hobby, but it's uh, it, it's worth it. Is just to clean your figure, your um, feeders regularly with a weak bleach solution, and then wash the birds that are coming. If you start to see conjunctivitis around the eyes, feeders can be a source of disease spread. So that bird that's sick um, comes and scratches or rubs its eye against the feeder, and another bird comes and lands on it. It can be a reservoir for spreading disease. So. Um, Again, just be, be careful and clean up seed that's spilled on the ground, especially in warm weather, because it can get mold, moldy and, and pose a problem there. All right. So as far as other wildlife go, outside of probably squirrels and birds, um, we really don't encourage feeding. And in fact, in some counties with um, chronic wasting disease, it's illegal to feed um, deer or place um, food in a manner that deer can encounter it. So feeding can cause disease outbreaks, it can lead to an overabundance of wildlife, it can cause damage to habitat, crops, it can threaten human health and safety. So this bear, uh, probably in the spring in the north especially, we get tons of calls of bears around yards. And it only takes one question, do you have a bird feeder up? Yeah, they're really hungry because they're coming out of hibernation and especially this past winter where we had that late winter, the natural forage wasn't available to them. So they were mighty, mighty hungry and desperate and coming really close to um, humans for garbage and, and bird feeders. So especially in the north, um, we just don't, we tell people just don't put your feeders up until uh, late spring. And then uh, feeding can also cause wildlife to rely on an easy but nutritionally poor food. <coughs> Okay, so moving on to water. Um, animals need water for drinking and bathing. It could be as simple as applying or putting out a bird, uh, just a saucer for a bird to get water in, a bird bath. It could be creating a pond, or some of you maybe even have a very large pond or maybe a wetland complex on your property. Um, if you're supplying the water, you're gonna wanna keep it fresh, change it every few days. In a small pond with an area large enough to support plants will broaden the range of wildlife activity. And if you can provide moving water, that will even up the diversity of wildlife uh, even greater. Um, heated bird baths in the winter, if you're willing to, to supply them, uh, it's really wonderful. And bird baths themselves, if you make your own or fabricate your own, should be no more than three inches deep and have a rough slope. Uh, uh, sloping bottom to prevent drowning. So when we had drought a couple years ago, I know um, people were putting them out like swimming swimming pools, the plastic kiddie pools, and filling them with some water, but it became a death trap for birds because they would get in there, and if the water was too deep, they couldn't get out. So if you're gonna do that, at least put 
some kind of structure, a couple blocks of firewood or a ramp or anything like that so that they can get back out of there. But if you don't currently have a water feature on your property or in your backyard, by adding that you will definitely increase um, the wildlife. So things like nighthawks or um, a variety of birds and turtles and frogs, that whole amphibian core. And then I'll just point out I won't spend much time on it because rarely are there more than a couple people that find themselves in the situation where they have a lake on their property, but the Minnesota DNR has a publication called Lakescaping for Wildlife and Water Quality. So if you live on a shoreline um, or you do have a lake, there are specific kind of how-to manuals for things you can do to restore that uh, shoreline with natural vegetation and encourage wildlife. So for cover and shelter, um, the, the terms are interchangeable. I'll probably use, use both as I move forward here, but it's any place that protects wildlife from predators and adverse weather conditions. And different species have very different cover requirements, and it's particularly critical when animals are nesting and raising their young and when animals are resting. So we think about a mallard duck or a woodcock or a... Um, a oh, of uh, some of the grassland birds that nest on the ground. They nest right on the ground, so they need camouflage and they need certain grasses. Some will require a different density and height of grass than others. And then there are other species that obviously nest higher up in the canopy of the trees and need different um, components to their um, habitat as well. So some different examples of cover and shelter that you can uh, provide. And I'll start by talking about some non-woody options for you. So if you have rock piles or stone walls, anybody have old rock formations on their property? When farms were clearing fields, they often used to just pile them up along the fence line. So I'm from Sheboygan County and there's a number of farms that still have them. However, many have taking the time to take all those rocks out and open up that fence line to create the bigger field, you know, even though it's probably only 10 yards. But if you have rock piles or fence lines like that, they are phenomenal habitat for small animals. Um, fox can den in them. Um, you know, again, some of the snakes and, and reptile species that again serve a purpose in controlling rodent populations, they're just uh, phenomenal pieces of habitat. Brush piles are another piece of cover and shelter, and these evergreens are dead shrubs. Even in, in your backyard, if you don't have a, a shelter belt or an area or a corner where you've planted um, evergreens, uh, it's something to really think about because that's that thermal cover that we're talking about with, um, with the songbirds that's so important, and other wildlife as well. On a bigger scale, you know, deer, that's the places that they're going to yard and group up over the winter to make it through. I assume the majority, if not all of you, own some piece of forest and some of your property contains forest just based on the area of the state that we're in. Um, <clears throat> the single best thing I tell landowners that own forested lands that they can do is to retain their snags. Snags are a standing dead tree. They provide homes to over 70 species of wildlife in Wisconsin, including birds, mammals, reptiles and amphibians, um, they're just so advantageous. <coughs> what happens though is <coughs> they're usually the first tree that's selected for firewood. Because they're already dead, they're taking up valuable canopy and space for the next generation of trees. And as far as firewood goes, it doesn't take very long to dry a dead tree and have it ready to go for the fireplace or the, the wood stove. However, as I said, um, during the different stages of decay that a tree goes through, those trees will provide different habitat for different species. In some cases, it's shelter. In some cases, it's um, actually insects that they're getting out of the trees. Okay? And then once that tree falls, now you've got a log that again continues to decay and make its own little microclimate. Uh, salamanders underneath there, if it's a large tree, you might have an animal that actually dens in it like a fox. So not only do we need 
snags that are just a couple inches in diameter that would serve for chickadees, but we also need really big diameter trees that would be homes for some of the owl species, or flying squirrels, uh, species like that. And then the last point here is leaving at least some leaf litter for ground feeding birds. Um, I've, I failed with my mom at home. She has a very well manicured yard and rakes all the leaves and um, you know they, they get them out of there. But if you can leave those leaves on the ground, again, many birds forage on the ground. Many small mammals use that for important cover to, to move from one place to another. The flicker is an example that it'll walk through that ground and, and look for insects. So leaving some of that debris, you might not think about it that much or you want this park-like setting in your backyard, but you will really be devoid of wildlife. Um, if, if you have no brush piles and you have no dead trees and you have no logs or sticks or um, structure on the ground. Uh, there's also um, right and wrong ways to build brush piles, which I didn't realize it was so technical. I thought you just you know, took the branches and piled them up. But you actually want to start with really solid bases. So cutting logs in like four, four foot sections and crisscrossing them assures that you always have crevices at the bottom as you put those tops on and they start to um, degrade over time. Some people I've seen use um, like black corrugated tubing or PVC piping, something artificial. But again, it keeps, uh, they actually have their own hole within that manufactured um, plastic that animals can hide in. So if you enjoy rabbit hunting, um, it can be fun to build some good brush piles so that you have that option. <coughs> no. Audiences kind of um, vary among the spectrum of whether they want to attract uh, snakes to their property. Snakes are very beneficial for farmers and for landowners who want to control rodent populations and there are also you know, 20 different species of wildlife, 20 different kinds of snake that um, you can manage for and try to attract to your property and enjoy them for what they have to offer as well. So there's actually ways to encourage them by building snake hibernation mounds and you do that by excavating a hole in the ground and I want to say are they usually <coughs> three meters would be about nine feet but that's the top part usually the bottom five to seven feet or so you want to be able to get them below the frost line so you probably know better in your local area what the frost line usually reaches you want to dig that pit and then put in large debris first like stumps and thin rocks and backfill it <coughs> and then you can add leaves and smaller debris like sticks and some loose dirt and things like that. And they'll make their way down into that pit and over winter. So snakes will often group up and find those hibernation uh, locations over winter there. And then come spring in April they'll emerge and then disperse across the landscape. So. When we talked about limiting factors, often it is a matter of not having what snags would provide. So these nesting structures for wildlife. So wood ducks would be their tree nester. And if you don't have that along your wetlands or the river that you might be on, you can build wood duck houses. You can build flying squirrel nest boxes <coughs> and put them in the woods. I don't know how many of you have realized you have flying squirrels, but you're in perfect habitat with um, the amount of woods that you have here in, in this area of the state, you just have to hang on to those dead trees. So my parents, my dad was filling a bird feeder at night, he had come home from a ball game and was putting seed out on a platform feeder and was in the dark but he realized that there was something small and furry on the feeder and it had jumped off and he was describing it to me and I said, you have flying squirrels. I said, that's great, we've lived there like 30 years and we're finally realizing that you've had flying squirrels. So I told him to put out a floodlight, a red floodlight, on a tree near the feeder, and then he hooked it up so he could turn it on and off from inside the warmth of the house. And then at night, he turned that red feeder on, and sure enough, the flying squirrels would jump in and out. They can't really fly. They jump off from trees and, and glide, and he would watch. we would watch them feed. So we'd sit in the dark house and all, line up my kids and 
you know, we watched the flying squirrels come in. So and then we put peanut butter on pine cones for them and they'd come in and lick up that peanut butter. So, um, but you gotta have those cavities. So you can also build those. So the one caveat with nest boxes and when you go to um, garden shows or places like that, you always see like some unique designs or crafty or I saw one once that was painted to look like a stormy cromer hat and it had a hole in it. And those are all neat and everything. But each species of wildlife that uses a nest box requires a very specific design for it to be um, served the best purpose. So wood duck houses, if you make that hole any bigger than what the hen's coming out right there, it'll make it really easy for um, uh, raccoons to reach in and grab, <coughs> grab the young or the eggs. Same for bluebird houses. We have a Bluebird Restoration Association in Wisconsin. They've done lots and lots of research over Bluebird House designs and have recommendations on their website. So we're kind of foolish to build something with four sides, a roof and a bottom and a hole. You're better to use their designs that have been tested against black flies and weather conditions and uh, predators and things like that. So if you want to build a, a box for a certain species, owls, um, squirrels, Kestrels. <coughs> Do your research, and the internet's got lots of great science based on websites for that stuff. Bats are also another animal that you can build shelter for. And right now, our bats, especially the cave bats, we have eight species of bats. Half of them are cave bats. They overwinter here in the state in a hibernaculum cave most of the time. The other four species migrate, so they go somewhere south to survive Wisconsin's winters. The four species that stay here are prone right now to white nose syndrome. Everybody heard of white nose syndrome? So it's a cold loving fungus that grows in caves. It started on the east um, and it's moved into about 26 states. We documented it in Grant County, not too far from here, uh, last winter. And we'll see what happens this, this winter. We've got a great ecologist team working on monitoring for white nose syndrome. But anyway, um, it's a deadly fungus that grows on the bats. And basically what it does is it irritates them that they arouse during the winter, wakes them up, and there's no bugs or insects for them to feed on. All of our bats are insect eaters. And they end up spending, en spending energy and have no way to replace it. So it wipes out, um, it's been wiping out 90 to 100% of the bats where it's found in those caves. So it's been millions of bats that have been killed at this point because of that. So there's a lot of research going on, much of it in the Madison um, facilities right now. So bats might be something that, because of that, you decide to do a little bit more for. And what we're talking about are really summer roosts, places for them in the summertime to hang out. This wouldn't be warm enough in the winter that they would overwinter in a bat box. But again, they, um, a, a, little, a single little brown bat can catch more than 600 mosquito-sized insects in an hour. We wish they would only eat min, min, uh, mosquitoes or select for mosquitoes, but they eat a lot of other insects too, like flying, um, flying insects like moths and things like that. And there's um, better places than others to place um, bat houses, probably the best place to go for information on bats is Bat Conservation International, bci.org, and their, their mission is to protect bats around the world. Jamie, mm -hmm. and bats, do they, uh, do they like it up high or low? <coughs> you got a bat house up 15 feet up on a ridge, <coughs> and I had bats in the area, but they seem to like the siding. I have the steel siding on my house. They like it better than the bat house. So the big thing here is going to be warmth. So south and east facing uh, locations for the bat house and don't put it on a tree, at least in the woods. Most of our bats need, you know, they're, they're consuming insects, they're out in the open. So the best place to put it is on a pole as high up as you can get it or fabricate a way to get it up high and then facing south or east in an open area so they can feed on insects. If you have any kind of pond, put it near there because they'll catch insects off the top of that pond. If you're gonna put it on a building, high up on the peak in the south or east facing side. And then again, in Wisconsin, we're gonna to wanna to paint ours brown or black to absorb more heat. If you live in Texas or over winter in Texas yourself, don't paint them brown or black down there. Um, 
too, they'll get too hot. So, um, so and you can try relocating. Usually, uh, it takes a few years for them to find them and decide that that's a suitable location. You could also consider putting the bathhouse on the side where they're getting into the siding. If if you don't mind putting it on on the home or the, the building. Yeah. I've noticed is they like it near the air conditioner because it throws a lot of heat. It's, it's the warmth. And yeah. It's the warmth, and even though the air conditioner is on the north side, they like it's to nest right in there because that when the air conditioner yeah. is running. So in that, I mean, in that case, I mean, you could try putting a box near there yeah. just so that they're not in your siding. Sure. But um, that's that's why they're choosing it. You've got that right. right. Yeah. And it's dark siding, so it's warm. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, some of their favorite spots on, on homes is getting into attics along the soffit lines, but also they like to not stay on the outside of the home, but behind the, the vinyl shutters. Um, it's hard because of the angle of the siding, there's always crevices there, so you can use like an expandable foam to seal up those crevices. So. And then the last one is space, as far as habitat needs, and every wildlife species has a unique <laughs> pattern. Um, of space or territorial needs. And we need to know for the species you're interested in attracting, how much territory, if they do defend the territory, um, how much space they need. And that'll help you learn what you can expect, what would be reasonable. So if you enjoy grouse and would like to have um, 10 grouse per 10 acres, you might quickly find that that's not realistic because they defend territories and it's more realistic to have one pair for that 10 acres. So we have to be realistic with what our goals are for wildlife as well. Same with bluebirds, uh, one to two pair in a one acre backyard. You know, you're not gonna have 50 bluebirds in your backyard. You're gonna have a couple pair if uh, you have an acre, acre lot. <coughs> but the good thing is, and you're in a really good location given the nature of the Kickapoo Valley Reserve, and the cooperative nature of the programs that happen here and reaching out to landowners is that you can reach across your boundary and work with a neighbor to provide the habitat needs. So some of these species are larger or cover more area. So turkeys, yeah, maybe you want turkeys on your property, but you don't have the roosting sites. They roost in trees, big mature oak trees with sprawling branches. Um, that's where they like to roost, or they like to um, be along river corridors, or need you know the oak uh, acorn mass. So if you don't have that, maybe you can provide the brood cover that they need in terms of grasses, so or crop fields where they come out and they're foraging with their newly hatched um, chicks and looking in for insects, which is really critical for their early development, eating all that protein. So you can work with your neighbors to supply that habitat for some of these larger ranging species. So in addition to the four habitat components, you also need to make sure that you're arranging these um, pieces throughout the property. So this is an example of a backyard. So we're looking at a very small scale. <laughs> and you're, even within your yard, you don't want um, all your food right here and your water bird bath in the back corner and maybe some conifer trees here. You really want to work on a plan that intersperses everything. So you've got maybe, maybe you've got two bird baths in your, in your backyard and you've got feeders in one location, but you've got um, the trees and shrubs are, you know, dispersed throughout so that there's cover throughout the area. And certainly on a larger scale, if you're going to put in a food plot uh, for deer, turkeys, whatever species you might uh, plant, uh, you know, in a, or leave in a, unharvested in a field, you want to plant that near cover so that those animals aren't vulnerable getting out to that field or that plot to feed. You want to plant that near cover. And then we want to think diversity again. Coming back to diversity of wildlife, we've got to have a diversity of habitat. So you, you want to plant for diversity. We've learned that through um, um, history with Dutch elm disease, right? You plant all these Dutch elm dis dis uh, trees along city streets, and then Dutch elm disease came through and wiped out 
lots and lots of trees. So you want to think about diversity in your woods as well. Um, oak wilt is something we have to be concerned about. There's lots of different tree diseases out there. So when you plant, think about it in terms of diversity. And that'll also attract a higher diversity of wildlife. Structural diversity talks about like living and non-living. So we've got the trees, but now we're talking about rock piles and brush piles and logs, the different feeders, um, different structures there. And the vertical diversity is the levels of habitat. So really looking at the property from the bottom up. So leaves on the ground, logs on the ground. Um, you want forbs, shrubs, different levels and successional stages or ages of, of the tree species as well. Because even birds, for instance, um, some nest on the ground, we talked about that. Woodcock are gonna be ground nesters, grassland birds. And then we've got our shrub level, like cardinals and robins. And then you've got other species that are nesting way high up in the canopy, so again. And I'll just run through some of these quickly, some points in, in summary. Selecting native plants, providing that diversity. Um, selecting plants that bear fruit, seeds, nuts at different times of the year. <coughs> Providing evergreens for the winter cover. Retaining snags and falling logs. Creating the brush piles, leaving some leaf litter. Reducing or eliminating the use of pesticides and herbicides, especially things like bluebirds. We know that they're susceptible um, to some of that. Turn more of your lawn into habitat for those of you that only have a few acres to work with. Hey, you can make more. If you, if you like the way this sounds and you want to bring in more wildlife, then just you know cut the corners a little bit on some of your property lines. Don't mow so much. You know, put in some more some more grass and so on. And then I can't not give a talk on wildlife and, and not bring up uh, the issue with cats. So just um, cats do a number on wildlife. So one of the things you can do is just keeping keeping your cat inside, encouraging others to do the same. Um, if you live on a farm, I always offer you know some sensitivity there knowing that you need to um, control pop, you know rodent populations and disease risks and things like that with uh, livestock but you know only only care for as many cats as you need to i guess is the is the message there and then i'm just going to walk you through a few of the resources and hopefully in the back of the room i had given you a handout that is colorful but in really small print that was a much larger poster that I had done, but was able to print it as a handout as well. So I think with the help of a magnifying glass, you'll just get all of those tips. Many, much of what's there is what I talked about today, um, tonight with some of those um, different habitat features. And then there's a resource page there on both attracting wildlife, and I also do similar presentations on dealing with nuisance wildlife and the different tips and tools and techniques to solve those problems. So if you do have that bat in the attic or the raccoon in the chimney, uh, you can work through that. So there are resources to get to a website on fact sheets there. These are some of our extension publications. I also have them to the left, uh, your right in the room that you can look at as well when we're done. Now let's just access. There is also an excellent series that the Department of Natural Resources has, has done on wildlife in your land. It's really a, the, intended, the intended audience is you guys. Um, so it's 14 publications and it talks about planting trees and shrubs for wildlife, managing dead wood, the critter condo, con, condos, managing grasslands, there's one on wetlands, there's one on forest management, um, brush piles, and on and on. And that, I gave you the link, they're all available by PDF off of DNR's website. And then I'll point out, um, yes, this is a, these are Minnesota publications, but they are really nice. I have three of them up here in the front of the room, and they are on woodworking for wildlife. That lakescaping one I mentioned, Wild About Birds, is all on bird feeding. And landscaping for wildlife, that one is really um, quite good. I used that as a guide when I did my own yard. And then if you really get interested in more of the backyard setting with this, there is a program that sometimes people enjoy being a part of, but it's the uh, Certified Wildlife Habitat. It's through the National Wildlife Federation's Backyard Wildlife Habitat Program. And essentially they have an application. You have to meet certain criteria within those habitat categories. So food, water, shelter, cover. They list out, you know, you need to have X number within food and be able to describe your backyard. And once you've met those criteria for the program, you can become a certified backyard. And 
What's really nice about it is you can get that sign and put it up, but it's a talking point for for others, if nothing else. Hey, how'd you get that sign? What does that mean? And you can talk to others about um, managing for wildlife and, and the work that you're doing and encourage them to do the same. And then birdscaping in the Midwest, I just offer that. Um, Marriott Novak, Novak does um, a really great job. This book's up here too, and it's a guide to gardening with native plants to attract birds specifically. And then just keep in mind, I mentioned the Bluebird Restoration Association, but there's many groups out there like it, both nationally and state. Um, these are a really small group, so Bat Conservation International, the Bluebirds, Turkey Federation, Rough Grouse Society, the Audubon Society. If there's a particular species you're interested in, there's probably a group that specializes in it, but there's also many of these groups specialize in the habitat where this species, that particular species is found. So Rough Grouse Society focuses on young forests, so aspen and um, alder, and Ducks Unlimited, obviously they're gonna focus on wetlands and grassland restorations and so on. And then lastly, I'm gonna talk really quickly about an opportunity that if you do own more than 10 acres um, and you're interested in more of this wildlife or managing uh, your property for wildlife that you can consider. You know, Adrian went through this last, um, last summer with me and that is the Wisconsin Coverts Project. And it's a woodland wildlife management program for landowners in Wisconsin or adjacent states that are interested in managing for wildlife. <coughs> and it's a three, four day, three night. We bring in wildlife and forestry professionals from state, federal, um, nonprofit uh, organizations to give you talks on, I don't know if I have, I don't have a slide with the, um, some of the subjects, but we talk about small mammals, reptiles, turkeys, early successional forest management for grouse and woodcock. We do a number of field tours. We take you on a tour with uh, foresters and wildlife biologists to look at different harvest strategies for timber and um, selective harvests and shelter wood cuts and clear cutting and what does it mean for wildlife. Um, so lots of great hands-on and, and just real social time with other landowners. And then we hope, we try to select people who are involved in their local communities and are willing to share the information. So it is kind of a train the trainer type workshop for us. And we encourage them to reach out and motivate other woodland owners and to develop a written wildlife management plan is kind of important for our program as well. And I think I will, um, I have some brochures here if you're interested. I think I'll leave them on the table and then you can pick them up if you are interested. We take 25 to 30 landowners. It is an application to apply just to collect some information about you. And our workshop for 2015 is going to be August 13th to the 16th. And we hold it up at um, near Monaco, Monaco Woodruff area, at Lake Tomahawk at the Kemp Natural Resources Station. And it's one of UW Madison's A, A stations. And it, their, their research miss, mission there is on um, forestry so, or natural resources. So if you're interested, feel free to talk to me about it. You can email me, but for sure, at least at a minimum, grab a brochure. And you can check out more on the website. And that <laughs> will uh, leave some time here for a few questions if you have them. Yes. I think that one of the biggest inhibitors of wildlife development for us is the deer. We're so overpopulated, and it, it really limits what we can plant. And as a consequence, our planting is, you know, you can have. Um, river birch, which they don't care for. Yeah. Our fir trees, we have white pine, which is really good for the birds, but they have to be surrounded by chicken wire until they're about five years old, or they just get devoured. Our arborvita are gone. Yeah. They eat our roses. I can't plant a garden. How um, how many acres do you live on? Is it are you pretty much? Is this a backyard? No. How many? No, this is a close to hundred. Okay. But they're it's diverse. They're it's hitting you close to home as well as impacting forest regeneration. Yeah, well. it's yeah. terrible. I invite everybody to come on I was gonna say, so you're probably used to hearing that, but hunting pressure is certainly one in talking with neighbors. Are your neighbors realistic in their harvest goals? Um are they, are they realistic? Well, are they interested in harvesting deer? Or, yeah. yeah. Well, okay. I invite one of our former neighbors to come this year. Yeah. We took, I think, two does and one buck. Good. I say, more does, more does, take more of them, you know. Yeah. Um, it's, ter it's a terrible problem for us. And it is really, really difficult. Um, 
So I'll uh, hesitate to make the plug, but my husband is um, the section chief for wildlife within DNR, so he oversees deer and wolves and bear and all that fun stuff. But he's also starting the new program, the Deer Management Assistance Program. And that program is a program that you can enroll in, and the goal of it is to work with landowners to find the balance between habitat and deer numbers. Now, some of the people who enroll in that program are interested in more deer, big deer, trophy deer, right? And others are coming from it from a sustainability or regeneration of the forest, or they're growing trees for income production, and they're very much interested in more from where you are. They recognize they have too many, and they want help reducing them and, and figuring that out. And that's through the DNR. And it's through the DNR. Do you, do you just type in DMAP on their homepage, and you'll get more than you want to know about it. But um, there are different levels to which you can participate and you need a certain amount of acres. So I think it's 160 to get those site visits, but you can work with a neighbor and enroll as a cooperative because we can't manage deer on 40 acres. We have to work in a cooperative unit to have any impact. And that's where I'm curious, you know, if you can reach out to the neighbors, but also one of the small incentives is that you can get your antlerless tags at half price. So instead of paying the $12, it's $6. They don't hunt. You, get, you can get them though and Give offer those as an incentive. Mm -hmm. um, so there are some things to at least investigate with that, but I think personally what I see is one of the strongest reasons to be involved is that you'll continue to get publications and educational materials on an every other week basis emailed to you, but it's those site visits that you're going to get from a wildlife and um, forester to come and walk that property and start to address some of those concerns and that forester can help you with suggestions on regenerating um, oak if that's what it is and um, things like that. So, And closer to home, our Arborvitae are really tough. Uh, my parents lost all of theirs uh, two years ago and I don't think they'll ever plant Arborvitae again. There is a book over here called Deer Resistant Landscaping. I'll preface that by saying that I don't think there's anything they won't eat depending on the situation that they're in. So extreme winters, they eventually have to work further down the preference list. And one thing you can do, I tell people if they're planting their local, or like their um, backyard landscape, is to drive around the neighborhood and see what's making it through the winter in terms of the, the neighborhood and what the deer are preferring and think about planting those. But often we do have to use um, some kind of a repellent or mechanical protection on some of our favorite ornamentals and trees and shrubs and stuff. So it's a lot of work. Yeah. Yeah. A question and a comment. Uh, the comment is uh, we had fun the last two summers providing nesting material. Oh. So we, we cut little lengths of baling twine, not the synthetic, but the old fashioned jute, and just put a brick over it so it was sticking out. And the birds would come and pull the individual fibers out, making their nest. And there's several different species came by. Yeah, I've heard um, other people doing that too, taking this this one person, it was their, their child's long hair, and, you know, taking it off the brush and leaving it near on the ground, or horse hair and things like that too, and just being able to open up the nest box later with her and say, look, look your hair is all woven into that nest, and, you know, pretty neat, so. Yeah, uh, my question is, how do you get hummingbirds to come to your hand like that? I saw that picture. Yeah. <laughs> oh, and that, I probably, I mean, obviously I grabbed that from somewhere else, and whether that's a good thing to do or not, you know, just bringing them in closer. I've seen plenty of pictures with seed and chickadees coming in as well. And it's just a matter, I mean, I can fill my hummingbird feeder. That was not me, but I mean, that wasn't my, anybody that I know that took that picture, I grabbed that picture off of some site. But when you remove your hummingbird feeder, I mean, I've had them come to the feeder as I'm just hooking it up. They just get really accustomed to you. I mean, if I sit in a lawn chair on my patio, they'll be buzzing right over right over my head. So I'm sure they just spent their time, um, you know, waiting it out. So. Yes. Yeah, um, is there any plans at all to figure out something we can do about whippoorwills? Whippoorwills? Yeah, they used to be a huge population in this area when I was a kid and now they're gone. Yeah, they're not gone yeah. completely yet. Actually, the morning I turkey hunted this year, I was, I could have gone home just knowing I have, I heard whippoorwills that morning, so I woke up, you know, listening to them. But um, it has to do, I believe, well, it's a habitat changing for them. And it, it's actually, we used to graze a lot of the woodlands, and they needed that bare ground. 
And I think that was part of it. Um, but they are definitely declining. And there are surveys now for night hawks and whippoorwills and some of those species continuing to monitor those trends. But when I talk with like Ryan Brady or Andy Palios with DNR, it, um, it does have to do with habitat changes. So they're tracking it and I guess I'd probably refer you to one of them for what can we do about it. Yeah. But yeah, I'd have to dig a little deeper too and see if any of that information has been provided. So. Um, uh, maybe we can talk just briefly a, a little bit. You had mentioned uh, the distance of the bird feeders from the yes. windows, but also like I put a uh, fruit tree netting over my windows, yep. which eliminates like 90% of the window strikes. And I know here in the lobby they did this, uh, they put up the strips of uh, like mylar. Is it mylar? Is it core? Core? Yeah. Core? It has to be a certain distance apart. Um, and I, from my reading, I think window uh, collisions are what, number two or number three now in bird deaths overall? Yeah, they probably are, especially when you think so, about like migratory um, paths along like um, the Lake Michigan shoreline and all the yeah. you know, places. But even residential, I used to be a yeah. window washer, yeah. and some of these houses are, are really super yeah. deadly. And so window collisions happen um, for a couple of different reasons. Sometimes your living room window aligns across yes. the house with another window right there. So when you have both blinds open or drapes open, the birds see right through your house. And they're actually looking at the vegetation on the other side and they don't realize that the house is in between. Um, so it's a pass-through situation. It can be solved by closing the blinds, the drapes on one of those windows and not creating that image. The other thing is seeing the reflection of habitat. So it's a bright day, and they actually see the reflection of the vegetation on this window. They're seeing the vegetation behind them, and they crash into it, thinking when they flee from that bird feeder or they're just flying through, they collide into the window from, from, for that reason. And that's where hanging the bird netting or material, as long as it is taut, really tight crossed. If you make it too soft, it's like a mist net then that we use for catching birds to be able to ban them is they kind of, you know, land into it and get tangled up in it. So you just, if you use bird netting, you want to make it really tight. And then you could put in, you've probably seen like the hawk silhouettes, those black silhouettes, they're not very appealing to the eye. But if you go to a nature center, they have some that are nearly invisible from the outside, like in a hummingbird, and, but yet from, I'm sorry, from the inside there, you can't really see them, they're more, transparent but they still break up that reflection you can hang cds you know a cd moving uh, reflecting in the window the other thing you can do and it's um you wouldn't want to put a bird feeder then because you're providing that cover but if you plant shrubs or a high hanging or a medium-sized tree like a shrub like tree like a cranberry or something near that window it can also provide that shade a little bit or break up the reflection um, of the window. And then the other time is sometimes you get a robin or a cardinal, a male during the breeding season, sees its own reflection and they continue to bang against the window, right? And in that case, it's an individual animal and just going out there and covering the window from the outside with a blanket or something like that, they'll move on within a day or two and, you know, move from there. So knowing why they're doing it helps. A really wonderful website that deals with window collisions is Cornell Lab of Ornithology. If you've never been to Cornell Lab of Ornithology's website, please go there. They're the ones that oversee Project Feeder Watch and um, another, a number of the citizen science um, opportunities that you can participate in as well. But they have information on window collisions and how to prevent them. And they also have um, a subset of their site. It's called All About Birds. And it's basically an online field guide. And it's really cool. So when I get an email or a picture or somebody calls and says, oh, I've got this bird, it looks like this and this, and I send them back the link right to that with the bird up, and they can listen to it. It's got vocalizations. It's really wonderful. So if you don't own a field guide, that's a really nice um, substitute. So, yeah. What's the name of um, it? Cornell Lab of Ornithology is... Lab of Ornithology. <laughs> They're out in New York, and then they're specific, that website part or the field guide part is all about birds. Even if you just did an internet search for all about birds, you would get it. 
And speaking of that, if you have smartphones and you're looking for a cool app, there's one, I've, there's a lot of different bird field guide apps, but there's one that I particularly like that I've been using is All Bird Pro. And it's like 15 to $20 to download it. Um, but what's really neat is when you see a bird and you just have a paper field guide, you're at the mercy of your ability to navigate that field guide and figure things out. This app has a list of, I don't know how many different things that you can toggle. So the first thing will be like, what state were you in? Okay, Wisconsin, what habitat type? It was a wetland, clearly a wetland. Or, well, it was a wetland next to a grassland. You can toggle on both of those. Then it was, what was the size of the bird? And if you're not sure between two categories, you just pick them both. Um, what was the silhouette? So that gets you into, was it a duck or a shorebird or a hawk or an owl? So you can click on that. And you just keep going down. What was the major color, tail length, feet, anything that you can remember about it. Meanwhile, your list has gone down every time you click on something to your possibilities. So it might be down to 11 and you add one more thing about beak shape that you recognized and now you're down to three. And then you can look at them. And you just scroll through and you can look at those three and um, see if you can figure it out. I just, I think it's pretty neat because it takes all of the possibilities and narrows them down without you being the one flipping through the field guide trying to figure it out. What's the best app I can download for a bird song that has like a lot of the more uncommon birds? Well, I haven't done bird songs. Um, I would say probably going to like East, the Peterson's Eastern region. You know, some of those that they had on CD as well. I'm sure there's some of those on song. But um, that All Bird Pro that we just talked about. Mm -hmm. it, it does have that. That's everything, yeah. Oh, okay. So as long as you know the bird or you're trying to figure it out between a few, like you get it down to those 11 different warblers and you're not sure which warbler, mm -hmm. you can you can play. You can sit there and play. Each one of them's got a number of different songs. What if I think it's between, I know it's like one or one of maybe two different warblers, can you go right to the song? Yep. You can you can do a search within that app, right for the name of that bird and listen to it. So. And the one caution I'm uh, compelled to say though, with those apps, and um, birding etiquette, we don't want to be doing that in the field. So you want to do that inside a car or back at home because it stresses out the birds because you're essentially playing a competitor out in the, out in the woods. So sometimes um, most of the um, birdathons where you go out birding for the day, it'll say that you, know, you cannot use any electronics or things like that because what you could do is like a callback. You could go play the bird hoping that species calls back to you to be able to get it on your list and that's not that's not cool. So what was the name of that app again? The app is All Bird Pro. All I can't Pro. find it. All is Bird it, is Pro. It I, I'm sorry, iBird. Yep, iBird. iBird Pro. iBird The letter I? The letter I. Okay. Yep, Bird Pro. Um, first of all, water in the winter. Yep. Uh, what, what, <laughs> I, you know about this, right? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, the issue is I live on the ridge. And my argument is that I live on between the north and the south branch of the Bad X, so I'm saying I'm not necessarily supposed to have water in the winter. But, you know, we can have a debate about this. And then if I wanted to have water in the winter, and no running water on my property on the top of the ridge, so what's the options? For providing it for yeah. wildlife? And is it really necessary? It of those right? four, wildlife is probably, so when we talk about limiting factors, the limiting factor is the the reason why a species is not occurring on your property. Yeah. Okay, so let's say you want to have bluebirds on your property, but you don't have bluebirds on your property, and you've got grasslands, and you've got this and that, and everything else for them, but we realize you don't have shelter. You don't have the nesting boxes and the shelter for them. Um, animals, usually limit uh, water is not a limiting factor for them. They find it in some manner, because think about the winter. It's cold, yeah. right? Yeah. So they either get it from the snow, um, or they're getting it more likely from the vegetation or the animal matter that they're consuming. The animals that water becomes an, a limiting factor for are, are our amphibians, right? And turtle species, in the winter they hibernate so they get below that frost line. Um, and of course you're not gonna have turtles up on the ridge because right. no matter what you do, you're probably not gonna have turtles up on the ridge, right? I don't have a pond. Either. You don't have so a pond. I had a pond. So I would say in your situation, yeah, there's, other than if you wanted to put out a heated bird bath, you will enjoy some winter visitors and the, you know, sitting in the rocking chair and enjoying those with a cup of coffee on, in the morning. You're going to enjoy some more um, visitors that way. But yeah, I, 
I focus my efforts on food and cover. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that might be a good place to stop. I'm sure Jamie will stick around if anybody sure. else has any bashes.